Toronto with the last keynote of, the, of this morning, Chris Makey from, uh, from Boston. So he will show what he did for like um, using a plugin for Rhino. We will discover that. And after that, we have uh, five um, lectures, uh, paper presentation. Uh, so it will be related to thermodynamic uh, for about climate, but also about sound. And so I think it will be interesting to see some different strategy on different uh, element of architecture, how to design things uh, with that. So thank you, Chris, for being here. Okay. And thank you, Philippe, for that wonderful introduction. And, uh, and before I start, I just want to say I'm honored to be speaking uh, on the same stage as many people who inspired my, uh, my thesis years ago. Uh, hopefully, I can, I can do you all justice. <laughs> um, but today, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I am the co-founder of a series of environmental design plugins, uh, for, mostly for Grasshopper, though now also for Dynamo. Um, uh, co-founder, I say co-founder, along with uh, Mustafa Rudzari, who also wanted to be here but could not uh, quite get out of his teaching duties. Uh, but I will, I will do him justice. Uh, and just to give you some background, we uh, uh, collectively we have four insects, although one that's under development. Uh, one just for climate analysis and visualization of climate data. Another for advanced energy simulation in daylight, and another for uh, airflow modeling in CFD. Uh, and all of our plugins are free and open source. All the engines that we link to are open source. Uh, and that is one of the main reasons why we are uh, together the third most popular plugin for Grasshopper uh, and just past 100,000 downloads. Uh, and so today, while I'm going to speak a little bit about, uh, give you some examples relating to the thermodynamic top topic of what we're talking about here, uh, I'm mostly going to be talking about uh, software and more specifically this idea of a toolkit. Um, largely because the, the point of our, or at least the theme of our conference is humanizing digital reality, and I want to talk about really that human interface with our digital reality, with that, with that software. And this notion of a toolkit is uh, a concept that both Mustafa and I have been trying to articulate for many years, uh, that we have hopefully done justice within the, the paper we published alongside this, this conference. Uh, and it's also something that a number of our colleagues who also develop uh, Grasshopper plugins feel uh, accurately describes why their plugins are, are successful. Um, uh, but first, before delving into what exactly I mean by a toolkit, uh, I want to just give a little historical context. Uh, and this, just to start, a lot of you may be familiar, very familiar with a, a way of working with software uh, that I will say is kind of our historical software situation, in where we have separate software packages that are importing and exporting common data types to one another. Uh, and so these pieces of software are kind of fundamentally disconnected and really only able to talk to each other through these, these common uh, file types. Uh, and this has a number of pros and cons. Uh, the benefits are that you can add in more pieces of software to this kind of amorphous network. Uh, and in that sense, it is a bit flexible and adaptable and extensible. Uh, and at least within each software package, you can iterate and, and actually achieve a design process. But many of us may also realize there are a lot of drawbacks to this, this sort of style of working in that it's, uh, it's a bit redundant because more often than not, let's say you want to make an energy model in one piece of software uh, and you may have some, need someone to export CAD drawings to that other piece of software where you then trace over those to recreate another model. Uh, and so all this remaking of the model each time is a bit inefficient and redundant uh, and makes it difficult for us to collectively iterate across those software packages, even if you can iterate within one of those. Uh, and in terms, and in the end, this can kind of also lead to a sort of siloed way of working where you have an expert in your energy modeling software, an expert in your design software, and they aren't necessarily talking to each other that much. So in response to this, uh, many of us may be familiar with maybe not one that, uh, and a concept that has actually caught on, but uh, a notion that is at least being uh, marketed to the design community right now, which is to have a central model that exports, simply exports uh, the most recent design to all these different interfaces directly. Uh, and we'll refer to this kind of as the sort of centralized tool as opposed to the disconnected one. Um, and I say contemporary because it hasn't necessarily caught on yet, but we have a sort of central model that exports that, that information. And uh, benefits are that, I mean, ideally things are connected, and for that reason it can be much more efficient. But many of us know, if, if you've tried to work in this, this method right now, 
uh, that in the same way that we have a law of inertia in physics where the more mass within an object, the more energy it takes to move it, uh, we might also uh, sort of say that there's a law of design inertia where the more information that you put into the model, the more human energy it takes to iterate and actually design with it. Uh, and for that reason, when we put all of our details into one sort of central model, it can make it very difficult for us to, to still to iterate, uh, even if you can push that data quickly to, to other pieces of software. Uh, and so because of that, because of that difficulty with iteration, and because, uh, in a sense, a lot of these other packages depend upon that central model being updated to do their own iteration, uh, it's, it, can be, it can stifle that iterative creative design process. Uh, and so when we take a sort of step back at this historical context and we look at these two method methodologies together, um, well, we can say that probably both of them have significant drawbacks to the point that neither of them is really realizing the potential of what we would like to do with our computers and what we would like to do with our software. Um, and if we take a step back again and look at, you know, why this might be the case, we will realize that both of these philosophies focus on tools themselves as the solution. Uh, in, I mean, you can see it very clearly in the centralized model that you have some super tool that is, is meant to uh, solve all your problems. Uh, but we also see that, uh, that same situation afflicting the sort of disconnected tools here, where each tool is only concerned about itself and not about the workflows between it. Um, and so that's why, I mean, we can imagine this, a lot of the, uh, be before I, I had started working on Ladybug, a lot of tools that I had been working with were very much so like this, that they were focused on that tool and that tool itself. Uh, and, you know, in that sense, they were very much so like a very well-crafted hammer. They were meant to do that one thing and one thing very, very well. Uh, and as long as all your problems are that same, that same situation, that tool is a very great thing to have. That will make your process efficient, that will, that will do it. As long as, let's say, you just need to create documentation drawings, a, uh, a tool that takes a 3D model and makes plans is, is perfectly suitable for that. But as we know, many of us encounter throughout the design process uh, new creative ideas we want to test out, uh, something, uh, or we encounter a situation that is not a part of that sort of standard fluid just uh, from early design to late design process. And we can try and use our sort of tool that wasn't really designed for this problem to, to deal with it. But ultimately, what we don't really want is just that one tool. Uh, and it took me quite a, some time to realize this. But what we want, in reality, is a tool kit. We don't necessarily want to do that one job, but we want the ability to mix and match different types of tools in our workflows. Uh, and the reason why I thought this analogy was appropriate, not just for Ladybug and Honeybee, but for a lot of uh, the grasshopper tools that we use these days, is because they literally are manifestations of tools themselves. They are individual components, uh, and much in the same way that you have a set of tools that you will link together in a workflow to, let's say, create a piece of furniture, uh, as you see up top, you have individual components that each perform a specific function. And much like the way you would build a piece of furniture, you simply link these together to answer custom questions or build custom tools and, and test new and creative ideas that you might not have been able to do otherwise. Um, and so really, this is really what I want to focus on. The fact that you connect these tools together, that is fundamentally what, what describes a toolkit as opposed to these two philosophies that are focused on the tools. That rather than being individually honed in on just that one tool itself as the answer to your problems, it's focused on the workflows and the interconnection between tools. Uh, and so the rest of what, uh, the talk that I'm going to show here, we'll, we'll get to some concrete examples, uh, but, uh, but I'm just going to talk about what exactly makes a software a part of a toolkit and what enables this ability uh, to fluidly work between different interfaces. Uh, and uh, together, uh, in, the, in the paper we published alongside this talk, uh, Mustafa and I developed sort of five principles of the toolkit, each of which I'm going to go through uh, individually right now. Um, and, uh, and these, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but these are things that we have found helpful and we think are important to the success that we've, we've had in, in our plugin. Uh, and it will hopefully be useful to those of you who are developing software yourself or are looking to find software that you can work into a sort of toolkit workflow. So first thing, first thing on our list of our principles of the toolkit is to do one thing and do it well. And if you're a computer nerd in the audience, you may recognize that this is actually not originally our idea. This is the first 
bullet of the Unix doctrine. Uh, and what, what exactly we mean by this of do one thing and do it well uh, is that one tool in your kit does not try really and, and become another tool. It does not try and do everything that another tool does. Uh, and we see this. I mean, a screwdriver does not try to be a wrench. And this actually, this specialization of tools is fundamental to what makes a, ser a collection of tools a part of a kit that you have a series of tools that are designed to do similar processes but slightly different and are honed for different sorts of situations. Um, and so what does this mean exactly for software? Uh, well, a famous example we might point to, I, I don't know what search engines were big in France in 1998, uh, but I can tell you in the US, the biggest search engine at the time was called Yahoo. And Yahoo did not simply try to be a search engine. It tried to be your newsfeed, your weather forecast, your marketplace. Uh, and their homepage showed it there, that you had a lot of extra things on, on the web page there. Uh, and along in that time came a, uh, a small startup made by a couple of engineers called Google. Uh, and they simply just decided that they were only going to have a search box, only going to be a search engine, uh, and just do, you know, and that would be it. And they were just going to do that one thing and they were going to do it as well as they can. And a lot of people attribute the early success of Google to the fact that they were just a search box, that that was their simplicity, that they just focused on that and tried to do it well. Uh, and now when we go to apply this concept to, let's say, the software we use in architectural design, and we look across uh, large plugin ecosystems like that around Grasshopper, where we have well over a thousand different plugins, the mere fact that you have so many plugins within the same space uh, creates almost a kind of selection pressure within that plugin ecosystem. Uh, and it forces each plugin to, to differentiate itself and to specialize and to, to do one thing and do it well, uh, so to say. Um, and, um, and just to give a, a, a concrete example of this, the fact that, you know, pulling out a few plugins here, uh, the fact that we have, let's say, a separate uh, most popular plugin for structural form finding and a most popular plugin for uh, structural solving, the fact that there isn't even one most popular structural plugin uh, should be an indication of how much of, a, of specialization happens uh, within the Grasshopper community. Uh, and Ladybug 2 is specialized in that sense, in that it is just focused on climate data uh, and, and thermodynamic modeling. Um, so, so that is what I, I essentially what I mean by do one thing and do it well. So this is to say then, so for those features that are not the one thing that you're doing well, uh, that is where the second principle of the toolkit comes, uh, becomes particularly important. Uh, and that is to build interoperability with other tools. So whatever things you are not doing within uh, your own tool, you should build interoperability to other interfaces that do do those things uh, well, that where that is the one thing that they do well. Uh, and so what I mean by interoperability, I think it's important to clarify this because, uh, well, maybe it's first easiest to say what I do not mean by interoperability. Interoperability is not simply the ability to import a standard file type that, uh, that another software produces. Uh, and as I sort of mentioned in the beginning, this is kind of, this just creates a sort of disconnected software. True interoperability is a two-way street. It has arrows going to the software and back from the software, both import and export. And ideally, you're actually using the tools that that other software has given you to build their, their, their files and, and to, to interact with that software. Uh, and specifically, that those tools are an application programming interface, an API. Um, and so this is really, that's just an important uh, distinction to make. That is what I mean by, by interoperability. Uh, and so what this means when, when it's done well, well, really what this means, if you're actually designing, trying to do one thing and doing well, that means you should plug into existing 3D modeling interfaces instead of adding a new drawing interface. Uh, people have been working on these CAD interfaces for over 20 years, so it's, it's a long road to try and do those things well. So you should try and plug into those as much as you can. Uh, connecting to validated simulation engines instead of building your own, because validation takes a very long time. Uh, and, uh, and if you can connect to an engine that is already validated, you will, you will be able to do your one task uh, uh, well uh, uh, without having to worry about that. Uh, and then plugging into existing graphical user interfaces where possible, like Grasshopper or Dynamo, uh, instead of building your own gra uh, graphical user interface, instead of building your own interface. Now, of course, there's an asterisk next to all these because the one exception is if the one thing you're trying to do well is, let's say, make a brand new 3D drawing interface that blows all the others out of the water, then by all means, go, go and build a, a 3D interface. Uh, but again, if, if, none of, if these things are not the one thing that you're trying to do exceptionally well, uh, you're better off um, uh, just, just trying to build interoperability with them rather than recreating that, what they do. 
Uh, and so in honeybee, let's say, for example, this is one of the insects of ladybug tools. Uh, this is exactly what we've done. Our plugin is really just a, a node between a lot of different simulation engines and between the CAD interface the, and, the, and the GUI and Grasshopper, the GUI or graphical user interface. Um, and so the fact that we, we're, Honeybee itself is really just a connection between these two, uh, or between not two, but multiple engines. And the fact that you can link all of these things together, you'll notice when, when you, that is your stated goal of that, doing that one thing and doing it well, um, you will find new capabilities can arise from this, from the sheer ability to have all these data sets talking to each other. Uh, and I'll give you an example of this right now as it relates to Honeybee. Uh, when you have all these engines together, there's a lot of data that you can get, related data, that you couldn't necessarily get just from one interface. So you can get things like surface temperature from an energy model. You can get uh, solar radiation from, from a uh, weather file. Uh, because we are right next to a, a rendering interface and a daylight modeling software, we can get view factors to those surfaces. Uh, and we have the geometry engine there in the CAD software that we can use. Uh, and for this reason, we can get lots of bits of data that you might not otherwise be able to get if you're only interacting with that one interface. Uh, and here you see four variables that are critical for uh, understanding indoor microclimate and indoor comfort. Uh, and specifically, I'm going to show you right now, my thesis was about taking these, these, these four things derived from the fact that we have all this interoperability uh, and merging them down into one sort of microclimate map that shows you the spatial variation of temperature across the space uh, and ultimately shows you that in relation to a comfort model, uh, which, which you see there, adaptive thermal comfort of warm versus cool temperatures across the space. Uh, and just to be clear that, I mean, the type of visualization you're seeing here is not one that had existed before because no one had really built all this interoperability before. Uh, and the key thing that defines it may be in relation to a uh, point in time CFD study, uh, which, which uh, a lot of my colleagues uh, have, have shown, uh, is that it's actually, it's temporal, that you, you have an hour by hour um, uh, view of temperature uh, over the space. And you can actually even simulate an entire year this way fairly quickly. Uh, for more than just a test box like you see here. Uh, and importantly, maybe I'll just play this one more time. So the, the notion of, that Philip introduced of the interior Gulf Stream of placing program in relation to a microclimate, we can now do this for a real passive building that we don't necessarily have to introduce heating and cooling sources. We can just use the sun and, and passive strategies to understand what the microclimate is and then help place our program in relation to that. Um, and uh, and uh, the other thing is that, yes, and that we're able to extrapolate this over time so we can really actually understand what the microclimate is, uh, not just for an instant, but for a longer period of time. Uh, and so, whoops, I think I have to go to the next slide here. So this then opens up new ways of designing. Let's say, I mean, traditionally, something that a lot of us, all of us almost have responded to here is this notion that we just expect our interior environment to be the same temperature. We rely on these fans mixing the air everywhere to try and give us this static neutral temperature. Um, and that, you know, that is maybe historically how, how we've worked with a lot of these things. But we know what something we might really want to do is be able to, let's say, make a nice sunny microclimate in the middle of winter where it's nice to sit uh, and warm yourself. Or a little cozy nook uh, where you take advantage of the stratification that, uh, that, that Philippe had demonstrated uh, in, in his interior Gulf Stream. Uh, or you want to retreat deep into your space in the lower areas in the summer uh, to keep yourself cool and come back out to the nice cool breezes in the night. That ideally we want to take advantage of these phenomena to design. Uh, and that's exactly what we can do. And well, we can also rediscover sort of social phenomena, uh, sort of, you know, having, instead of laying out our spaces in this sort of hierarchical branching of our power grids and our, and our HVAC networks, uh, we can rediscover these sort of past uh, 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 thermal phenomena of, of coming together around a hearth or a sunroom or a sauna and these thermal experiences. The same can be said in a cool envi or a warm environment where people come together around an earthen temple or an Islamic garden or, or a swimming pool. Um, and uh, ultimately, we can, we can then use our, our new capabilities that, are, uh, that are, uh, arise with our interoperability uh, to, let's say, test out every possible geometric variation that we could do on a test box uh, or in a single room. Uh, and as well as some other additional strategies like adding an evaporative cooling tower and find out what are the ones that are most powerful, what are the ones that uh, can accomplish things just with geometry and not necessarily need extra, extra bells and whistles on the building itself. Uh, and we can pull out, uh, let's say, some of the best performing ones like this 
the fact that this is, I should say, simulations within a, the climate of Los Angeles, which is, uh, on average, actually a pretty nice, comfortable temperature. Uh, but you get big extremes between night and day, and really hot temperatures in the day. Uh, but you find that if you create this sectional variation of just dropping the, the perimeter of, the, of a space uh, either up or down, you can create this cool microclimate within, in between those, tool, those two, which is what you see uh, in those two that are highlighted over there. So we can then take those, that, those sort of typologies that we've discovered, those sort of thermal typologies, uh, and let's say use them to remake our notion of, of a multifamily house uh, uh, by accentuating that interior microclimate, by stacking them in a way that still gives us uh, a good amount of spatial efficiency, uh, and by sort of varying them so that we get some privacy in between individual rooms. Um, and we can then go back after we've sort of looked at this and, and built the design with this, this notion of trying to tie program along with microclimate, and we can actually see that this, is, that this actually works the way that we expected it because we had built it with, uh, with models to begin with. Uh, and so you see here in the peak of the day at 3 p.m. in Los Angeles when it is incredibly hot outside uh, and these bedrooms on the periphery of the, of the, of the building are too hot to, to really occupy comfortably, our nice thermally massive interior spaces that we've created here are nice and cool and are good places to, for everyone to relax and come together. And we can simulate this then over time, starting at 6 a.m. where everything is nice and cool and comfortable across the whole building. Uh, and people are, are just sleeping in their rooms and they're a nice comfortable temperature. Then as the sun starts to stream in and we get close to the afternoon, those periphery spaces heat up. Um, and, uh, and as the sun starts to fade away, those, those spaces on the exterior remain warm, but we have a nice cool interior into, well into the, the deep afternoon uh, where people can, can uh, hang out, uh, as well as the sort of basement that makes use of that thermal mass of the ground until finally we get to the nighttime and the, and the space cools down and people return to those rooms. So we can actually design buildings this way now because of the newfound uh, capabilities that result from interoperability between tools. So that was, that was sort of a long summary of, of the second sort of principle that I, I wanted to talk about here, of interoperability. Uh, the third, I'm not going to spend too much time on because it's mostly an extension of the first one. So it's not always just enough to, to have your tools talking to each other or to be able to talk to different parts of software. But also within your own software, you need to allow the ability for, for, uh, for people to actually understand what is being passed back and forth between the different parts of your software. And that involves using standard formats for data transfer. Uh, and it's important to highlight this just because a lot of the times we only pass zeros and ones back and forth between the different utilities of our software or between the different components uh, in our definition. But this is something that we definitely take to heart in, in Ladybug and even deriving some of this data that is passed back and forth from other file types. Uh, so for example, our, the weather data that is used by most of the ladybug components uh, that can be plugged into most of those components comes from the weather file format that we, that we import uh, and is a, importantly a human readable text format. It's not zeros and ones. Uh, and we do the same thing for daylight materials and energy modeling materials. We derive those from, uh, from the actual engines. All right, so I said I was going to go quickly through that because I want to talk now about the next principle, which is very important, and that is the modularization of the tool. So it's of little use to pass, you know, human-readable data back and forth between different parts of your software if it isn't modularized to begin with. Uh, and many of you may recognize this immediately. For Grasshopper, you know, that means separating things into different components, but it can mean a number of, of different things, of just having different points in your software to be able to, to have people to put input. Um, or to check what's going on. Uh, and so we may sort of think classically, we, you know, where we have just a black box simulation, like a daylight simulation, you plug in your weather file, out pops whether you're code compliant or not, uh, and you don't see any of the things that happen in the middle of there. Uh, and really what this philosophy of modularization means, it means pulling out different parts of the things that are within this black box so that you can actually interact with them and visualize what is going on and, and if need be, change those if they don't necessarily meet your expectations. So instead of plugging your weather file directly into the engine, you use that to create a sky uh, and that from that sky model, you check it to make sure it's something that you want and then you, you run your daylight simulation. Uh, and just to give you a sense, that is exactly what we do with Honeybee Daylight, where we have you generate a sky with a separate component and then you can check 
to see if that's looking as you'd expect it. Uh, and if not, if this is not the sky that you were expecting, you can, yeah, you can therefore change it. Uh, and the same thing for visualization results, to actually be able to parse through those results, those very detailed results, and make sure that the simulation is running the way you expect it uh, before you, you figure out whether you're code compliant or not. Uh, and as an example of that, this, would just, this is just scrolling through the hourly daylight simulation results, the hourly illuminance values uh, that you get uh, with a small little flood plot there on the bottom to show you the actual hour of the day. And this, this way you can actually check to be sure the simulation is behaving the way you want before you take all those results together and tell yourself whether you're code compliant or not. So, uh, I mean, and this is to kind of really put, uh, uh, to show you how it's manifested in the software that, as I said, there are individual components. You have separate ones. We've broken out the sky, but also that sky is just one part of a recipe that accepts also points and also a whole set of simulation parameters that you have the materials separate from the geometry, that all this is modularized and broken out. Um, and just to kind of give you, like, to explain why this is important again, uh, I'm going to use an analogy of Legos. So uh, most of you, I mean, hopefully all of you know Legos, uh, and that there are eight, eight inputs on a, on a Lego block and eight outputs. Uh, and so when you have two Lego blocks, there are 24 different ways that you can combine those two Lego blocks. Uh, now, when you have three Lego blocks, you, you increase that by a factor of eight, so you get 1060 combinations. Uh, and so if you have six Lego blocks, uh, I'll give you guys a second to guess if anyone knows how many combinations you can get with six Lego blocks. But, uh, but you see the space there, so you know it's huge. Uh, so yeah, so there are over 950 million uh, combinations that you can make with just six Lego blocks. And now knowing this, I, let, I can ask you now, how many combinations do you think you can make with 730 components that are within, within our, 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 uh, our suite of tools? Uh, and of course, I mean, the, the answer is practically infinite. Uh, this set, of course, just in the same way that many designs that you could make with a bunch of Lego blocks are not things that we would actually want to make. Many of those combinations of components are not, not really useful. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that there's no necessarily one right way to use these components, that they can be mixed and matched. And the real important concept I'm trying to get at here is that there is a craft uh, and an art to how you arrange these, these components to address different types of problems in different types of situations. I'm going to give you three quick examples here of showing you how you can adapt to different types of situations when you have a modularized tool. Um, so normally we may think if we have sort of three possible uh, axes of, of types of design problems we can explore. So we can do a single engine, which you know we'll say an engine is like a daylight study or an energy model or a CFD study. Uh, and you can go from just one of those to multiple types of those studies. Uh, you can have a single model, so like a single design iteration going to several models or several design iterations. And then you can have a simple model, which is just like massing going to something detailed. And most of our conventional software is really meant to just take, use a single engine, a single model, and, and something simple. And a lot of our tools are set up this way. Although, I mean, admittedly, a lot of them are made to handle tons and tons of detail, a lot of our conventional tools. Uh, when we build the whole building in a 3D model of a building, that, that is definitely a detailed model. Um, but recently, we also now have the capabilities of, of actually running many, many different types of iterations with models. Uh, of generating a bunch of different parametric variations of those. Um, and so this is, this is a new sort of problem. And, but the reality is, though, is that not, our actual practice doesn't necessarily see, need the extremes that these, that these softwares go to. And most practice is sitting somewhere in, in, the, in the middle range between each of these categories. That we want to run maybe both an energy model and a daylight study. We don't need to run every engine possible. Uh, we want to run a few design iterations, uh, and we want to run it with a reasonable amount of detail. Um, and, uh, and so the ability, when you modularize your tool, you have the ability to sort of walk between these different areas much more easily. Uh, and as an example, this is a, uh, one example of uh, doing a lot of, of several models, uh, but that are very simple. Uh, this, is, this is called Design Explorer here. Uh, and it's a web interface that is mostly just visualizing uh, about a thousand or so energy and daylight simulations that were done uh, in Grasshopper. Uh, and the nice thing that you can see here is that you have inputs such as the depth and the height of the room, uh, and you have outputs like daylight and, en and heating and cooling energy use. And so I can say, give me just the ones with the best daylight and with the lowest heating energy and lowest cooling energy. Uh, and then I can go through my data set and actually see what each of these designs look like. 
uh, in, in real time. Uh, and so this is an example, a lot of, I mean, in the office where I work, the architectural office I work these days, oops, uh, I have to, I think, uh, yeah, represent. So uh, we're doing this type of study at the beginning of every project. When you don't necessarily have a mass, and we may not even have a site yet, but we have program, and so we want to understand what features are most important for us to pay attention to. What, what are the daylight and the energy most sensitive to? Um, and this, again, is being done with Ladybug and our tools, our modularized tools, that we're able to run these many different variations. And you can see this is kind of where we're fitting on that spectrum, that we have two engines, daylight energy, uh, and, and uh, with, with many, you know, a thousand variations of those. Uh, another case, so this is another project, this is the Culture Shed in New York City. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the project, maybe you know the, the, uh, the High Line, which was a park that was converted from an elevated railway. Uh, so this is that park right there. This is the end of that park. Uh, and this is a big art museum that is going in uh, that has this large ETFE uh, shed that pulls out to where exhibitions will be hosted in, uh, in summer, uh, summer months. Uh, and the key thing that, uh, that uh, we, we wanted to know as, as we were working on this was, are we going to get glare within the space? Especially because we're displaying art, we don't want people to have glare, we want people to actually experience and see the art. Uh, and so this was a, a condition where we only needed a single engine, we were just running daylight uh, to understand the, the glare potential. Uh, we were running several models, so we wanted to test a lot of different variations of frit patterns to see what the, what the glare effect was, and it was super detailed. When you're at that scale of modeling a whole pavilion, uh, and you're looking at just that little frit pattern, that is a very detailed model. Uh, and so this is a uh, radiance rendering produced with, with Honeybee uh, that shows you exactly what that looks like. Uh, and we ran simulations of this for every single day of the year for several different options. And so this is another sort of case study in until we found those, those, uh, those frit patterns that produce the least amount of glare for the space. So this is another type of way you see when you have a modularized tool, you can actually adapt to these different types of situations. And I'll show you one more example of this where we have just a single model. This was actually a research project uh, where we were trying to build the most accurate possible map of outdoor comfort that we could. Uh, and so we need, basically needed all of our engines to be able to do this. We needed uh, an energy modeling engine. We needed uh, to simulate outdoor wind flow. Uh, we needed uh, the weather file and solar and comfort models. Uh, and it was super detailed because we wanted to make the most, you know, the most accurate detailed map of outdoor comfort possible. Uh, and so we picked, this is just one site in Singapore, and I should say we were doing this to mostly to understand the limitations in the, in the other methods we use to map out our comfort uh, by building something so detailed like this. Uh, and this was really, again, an orchestration of engines that we were, uh, we were running, uh, we had to bring in 36 CFD studies uh, coming from our, our CFD engine of open foam using, using Butterfly to export to that. Uh, we had to mo use Energy Plus to model surface temperatures throughout that urban area. Uh, we were using a, a solar cow, which is a model to account for the effect of solar radiation on occupant comfort. Uh, we were using a, the Urban Weather Generator, which is an uh, engine designed to warp uh, weather files to account for urban heat island effect. And all this had to be plugged into a comfort model at the end. Uh, and so you can see these are some of those individual outputs that we modeled the urban heat island. Uh, we use that, that weather file to generate surface temperatures throughout the area, and we use CFD studies, 36 different CFD studies, uh, to get a sense of the wind patterns in that area. And we put this all together to make one of the most, at least we, we for now, is one of the most accurate maps of outdoor thermal comfort that was also uh, both spatially and temporally resolved. So this is an average over a long period of time. Uh, and again, we're using the, the comfort model there, UTCI, which some of us, I think, have uh, pointed to. But again, this is just showing you that um, you, when you have the, uh, the modularization, you're able to adapt to all these different situations and actually customize your studies to those. So I'm going to now finally move to the last principle here uh, to wrap up, uh, which is, I think, actually one of the most important. Uh, and that is something that we're going to refer to as Bushnell's Law. Now, for those of you who don't know, you probably don't know because I didn't know him before I, I encountered this quote of him. Uh, Nolan Bushnell was uh, one of the co-founders of Atari, uh, I guess which was over 50 years ago now. But he said something very prophetic about his most successful video games that are also very relevant to the software that we create. And he said that the most successful games they created were those that were simple to learn and easy to start, but impossible to master. 
Uh, and this is something that we really should take to heart when we design our software, because a lot of the times there's such a temptation to, let's say, just, oh, it's just one click and it's done and it's so easy and simple. Uh, but really, that is not, that is not really what, what people want. They want to become masters and craftsmen of, of our sort of modular tools uh, that, that, uh, that we had mentioned in the last section. And so what does this actually mean? I mean, I, I, again, to show that I'm not uh, basing this on, on totally uh, on just my own opinion, uh, some of you may know of something called the IKEA effect, for which I'm crediting uh, uh, Dan Airely, um, who is, is famous for at least bringing this to attention. But the IKEA effect is, is a feeling of ownership uh, after having spent time to work on something, uh, which many of us may uh, relate to after, if you've ever built a piece of IKEA furniture and you know that it takes like two hours and you have to put all of your blood and sweat into, into building this piece of furniture, but you feel an attachment to it afterwards. And the same thing goes for our, our pieces of, of software and the things that we create with those. Uh, and so how this manifests itself within Ladybug, this is one of the components that we have that produces a sun path in the Rhino uh, scene. And you see that there's only a single required input to run this component. You only need the latitude to generate a sun path. But you may ask yourself, well then why is that component so big? And you see the reason is because there's so many different ways to customize that to make that sun path your own uh, and to actually use it to answer different types of creative questions. Uh, and the same thing can be said not just about the components themselves, but about the workflows between them. So this is the bare minimum that's needed to run an energy simulation. It is relatively easy to start. You just need about six components or so, and then you can get a graph of heating and cooling out of there. But once you've done that, once you've started easily, you then want to say, all right, well, what about my passive design, my natural ventilation, my, um, my earth tubes, my solar passive heating? And you can customize that more and more and more. And this is the same type of energy simulation, but customized to make your own, make it your own and, and uh, answer a unique question. Um, so I'm going to give you one last example showing how this manifests itself in, in a real type of project. Uh, and that is to show uh, a sort of basic solar radiation example. So now, again, you see it's very easy to start. You really only need four components. Uh, and you can start producing like uh, cool looking graphics like what you see there of a radiation study of a whole city. Uh, but the important thing to highlight about this is that while you get this nice cool looking graphic and maybe hopefully you get some motivation to engage with it more, uh, radiation over the whole year, over the whole sky dome, as you see ex uh, exhibited there, is not necessarily very helpful for designing a building. It maybe helps you orient a solar panel, uh, but just knowing the total amount of solar that falls on the surface isn't necessarily the most helpful piece of information. So ideally, once you have that sort of basic setup, once you've started easily, you then want to say to yourself, all right, let me customize this to say, I'm going to pull out just that part of the sky that is harmful in the summer, and I'm going to write my own sort of function to say, like, all right, if the air temperature is greater than a certain value, that is what, what I think uh, is harmful sun that I need to block and shade myself from. And you can do the same thing with helpful winter sun that helps you passively heat and combine these together into a single sky like what you see here. Then you can sort of take that custom sky that, that is now your own and use it to, uh, to run different design iterations like you see here. Uh, and because you actually have that energy, that solar energy that are coming out of your study uh, and have a relative effect of how good, helpful versus harmful that is, you can get a sense of the energy impact just by understanding the amount of helpful versus solar energy that's falling on, on your design there and test out different variations of, of a facade that you see here to understand at least which is better than, than another uh, for your, your annual energy use, for that, that passive solar heating and for uh, taking shade in, in winter. Um, and because this is also a relatively fast type of study, you can even use that, uh, admittedly this is sped up from, from uh, the actual parametric model, but you can use that to really dynamically shape and come up with the design moves that, uh, that are, are most intuitive to maximize your green area or your net amount of helpful sun versus your harmful area, which is, is that, that, red, that red area there of trying to block that more. Uh, and ultimately then use that to shape your facade, as you see here, uh, or testing out uh, linking to other grasshopper plugins and testing out uh, uh, different ways that that might actually manifest itself. Uh, whether it be as a bunch of kind of futuristic bubbles or, uh, again, by adjusting the, the opening height of windows, as you see here, and the amount of shade, uh, and even sort of dynamically linking your massing model to that actual uh, uh, movement, uh, that desirability for shade of up and down. 
So hopefully you guys have gotten a sense and hopefully you found maybe some of these five principles helpful. Uh, but I just want to wrap up by, by again sort of saying that this idea of making it easy to start but impossible to master, it isn't necessarily just about making something that is incredibly difficult to really to, to do. Because if any of us have played those early Atari games, you know that like, they're, they are really impossible to beat. And, uh, <laughs> and sometimes you get so frustrated that you just put them down. And that's why it's also important to give people the resources to help themselves, to help them become masters at the tool. Uh, and one of my favorite quotes that I love showing, this is a, a dialogue between Mustafa and one of our users uh, that happened earlier. This was years ago as we were just starting. Uh, and Mustafa said, cool, I'm happy that you're getting involved in environmental modeling. Uh, and uh, our, our user writes back saying, oh, thanks a ton. Uh, your tools are a lifesaver, not just tonight, but they changed your life. They're making me smarter. And this is, this is what I loved here, not just because it warms my heart, uh, but because it makes me aware that these tools are actually working the way that we want them to, that, pe that people are able to become masters at them and teach themselves through use of the software uh, what exactly is going on in these simulations and how to apply them usefully. Um, and so with that, I mean, so really it's not just about making something easy to start and possible to master, but also setting up a discussion forum where we can discuss scientific ideas, the methods of the components, and ultimately revise those if we decide that they don't make sense. Uh, as you see, came out of one of, our, one of the discussions on our forums here. Uh, and we now have like over 2,000 discussions, a lot of many, 11,000 replies, 903 people who have, who have started discussions. Uh, and we have a lot of activity around that too. That's also very important, the fact that people can post a discussion and 80% of those in less than the day will get a response back. This is also what it means to, be, to, be, uh, uh, to make a sort of workflow for people to, to help themselves. Uh, and making an example file sharing platform so that people can share the individual things that they create. Um, and we can also add our own examples so we can point people to those when they get stuck uh, to, to figure out to help themselves. Uh, and ultimately, I'd just like to conclude by saying that it's really, it's, it's not about the tools, it's, it's about our workflows, our interconnections, and it's about the people who are, who are creating those, those workflows and interconnections. Uh, as you see here, hopefully uh, embodied by a graphic of our community, uh, just the smallest part of our community, if you, if, uh, if you will, is actually maybe, all right, I'll try my luck here. If, uh, we'll see how fast the internet is here, but we have a whole big graphic here. But when you have all those, these are all those 908 people uh, together in the discussions that they've, that they've uh, contrib attributed. Uh, and you can see that together, this is really what software is about. It's about all of us together, all these connections of people making connections and of helping themselves and, and improving themselves. So with that, uh, I will say uh, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. <laughs>